You really need a serrated knife to cut this or the pastry will just shatter. And it'll shatter if you try to do a thin slice. It's gotta be thick and chunky. It's almost that time of year again and today we're going to be seeing how Adam Ragusea makes his beef wellington. If you are new to the channel, my name is James Mickinson. I've been cooking for many, many years and I have just released my new website and merchandise. So if you haven't seen that, nor my other videos that I do have because I have recipe videos, then be sure to check out all of those things after seeing this video. And if you do happen to enjoy this one, well, then be sure to give it a like, give it a share, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button and the bell notification so you don't miss out on any future content. Now, let's get started. Okay, I'm a level with you. I do not think that you should make beef wellington. It's a ton of work, it's very expensive, it's extremely error prone, and I don't think it's that good to eat. But if you wanna see me make a wellington, well, here you go. This is the last time, I'll tell you that. Right off the bat, Adam says that he's never gonna make this again. This I do agree with, it's true. It is a laborious thing to make, and it is also very expensive. Now, as far as the taste goes, it's one of my favorite dishes. It's also, I believe, one of Ramsey's favorite dishes as well. Beef Wellington has to be the ultimate indulgence, one of my all-time favorite main courses, and it would definitely be on my last supper menu. You can, of course, buy frozen puff pastry, but I actually think the dish is better if you make what they call a rough puff pastry. Real machine-made puff pastry is just too delicate. It just flakes off. So for a homemade rough puff pastry, I am cutting one pound 454 grams of cold butter into large cubes. Well, no wonder Adam is saying that he doesn't want to make this anymore. He made his own puff pastry. Even chefs will buy puff pastry pre-made because puff pastry, making it itself, is in itself a task. There are recipes to make a quick puff pastry, but if you want to make it properly, it takes a bit of time. Transfer those to a big bowl, and now I'll weigh an equal quantity of all-purpose flour. One-to-one -one butter to flour. There will be more flour later in the rolling process. If you are going through the effort to make your own puff pastry, I highly recommend passing the flour through a sieve first. Sometimes you can have little hard bits in your flour and you don't want that in your final product in the puff pastry. If you use unsalted butter like I did, I would do about 15 grams of salt. That's a tablespoon of Morton Kosher. And for flavor and browning, a teaspoon or two of sugar will have a subtle effect. I'll toss that all together, mostly to get each butter cube coated in flour so that they won't stick to each other. Then it's time to work in just enough cold water to bring this into a shaggy, lumpy dough. Now, since puff pastry is mostly butter, it is a good idea to not use your hands to work with it. You can, but you need to keep in mind that this is one of those products that you need to keep cold. So if you overwork it and it comes up to temp, you have to chill it. So if you have a mixer at home, and I know Adam has a stand mixer, it is a better idea to use that to incorporate the flour. Now, supposedly the beef Wellington was first created for the first Duke of Wellington after his victory over Napoleon Bonaparte at the Battle of Waterloo. Too much water will make the pastry tough in the end, so literally just enough to barely bring this into a single mass. Let it sit in the fridge for at least a half hour to firm the butter back up and to let the flour particles hydrate. That's it. It has to be mixed properly. If it's not, you're not going to end up with a good puff pastry. Because if you look at this right now, you can see that the flour and water is mixed and it's keeping the cubes of butter together. That's it. Pull it back out and now it's much more cohesive. Flour the counter, flour the dough, and just start rolling. You gotta be really gentle on the first roll. It's liable to crack. Just roll a little and turn. Roll a little and turn. You can tell it's already cracking because it's not mixed together yet. And if you are making this in summer and it's a very hot day, you're gonna have to spend a little more time waiting for it to chill in the fridge. Turning ensures that the bottom is getting floured and it's not sticking, and it helps you to roll every part of the dough evenly and try to get it into something like a rectangle until it's about yay thick, a centimeter maybe. Now fold the dough in on itself in thirds like a letter. That moves the rougher edges inside where you can even them out in the next rolling, which will go much easier. The dough is getting more pliable. I don't have to be as gentle. Fold it again like a letter and repeat. We're gonna roll it and fold it a total of six times. Now as the butter is starting to come up to temp, it will be easier to work. You only have so much of a time frame to 
actually work with it before you need to chill it again. But it shouldn't be looking like this at this stage. You shouldn't be seeing little cubes of butter in between the flour holding it together. The whole idea of folding the puff pastry on itself is to keep adding layer after layer. And after you have so many layers, what happens when you go to bake it is that it will start to rise with the air pockets inside. And this is why it's called puff pastry. So the more layers, basically the better, but it takes a lot of time. After maybe the fourth fold, things start to get physically harder again. This is the gluten network starting to tense up. It requires a little more elbow grease, but it's really not that hard. And 10 minutes of rolling later, here is the sixth and final fold. I'll roll it a little bit just to make the layers stick, but we don't need to roll it thin yet. Wrap it up in something, let the butter chill again in the fridge so that it doesn't melt, and let the gluten relax again for another half hour at least. That much you could do days in advance. It's a good thing that Adam is showing you how to make his puff pastry here. If you want to learn on how to make a good puff pastry, then you should check out Chef Bruno Albuz. He is a French pastry chef. All his videos are in English and he has a quick recipe on how to make puff pastry. My point is though, is if you want to learn on how to do anything in life, this isn't just for cooking. Even if you want to learn, say, how to play the piano, it's better to go to somebody that has experience instead of learning from an amateur. Because more often than not, a pastry chef especially will show you tips and tricks that you can use at home to help make making puff pastry a little easier. A Wellington is made with a center cut tenderloin roast. And assuming you can use the extra meat elsewhere, it's probably a lot more cost effective to just buy a whole vacuum packed tenderloin. The butchery is not that hard. This is true. Normally you're going to pay more because you had to actually have someone do that work for you. So if you buy something that is whole already, normally it's a little cheaper. The only issue being is that the last time that I saw beef tenderloin per kilo, I think it was about 40 years per kilo and one kilo is about 2.2 pounds. If you have a family I can see doing this or if you're going to make it for a special occasion but that can be a little expensive to make especially today with all the prices going up. There are two extra muscles we need to get off. This one up at the fat end is the aliacus muscle. You can see the seam of gristle connecting it to the main psoas major muscle. If you're unsure literally just pull it and it will tear along that seam up to a point. You may have to get in there with your knife and finish the job but if we didn't take this off all of that connective <laughs> tissue between these muscles would be inside our roast and that would be gross. The aliacus is a great mini roast that you can use another day. Now, if you trim the beef tenderloin carefully and you leave the head on, you can actually tie it and make medallions out of this. But when cooking it, it is a good idea that you use the twine to tie it together so it stays in its shape. Otherwise, it can, you know, fall apart. Then there's the psoas minor muscle, also known as the chain. It's a very thin, long muscle that runs alongside the psoas major. Again, if you just pull, the seam will present itself. It's the first thing that tears. The chain is full of tasty fat. It's great great for kebabs. We're left with the psoas major, which we just need to trim of all of that exterior connective tissue, especially the silver skin there. So normally when I get a big tenderloin, what I do is I take it out of the bag and pat it down with a bunch of paper towels to dry it off because you need to be able to grab the fat, the, the silver skin, and all the other stuff that's on it. Now, the first thing that I start removing before cutting anything is the fat. And then I remove the chain. And then you start removing the silver skin. But the chain meat and any trimmings that you have if you clean that up a bit you can cut that up and use that for stir fries or use that for stews as well. Just get up underneath it and shave it off. You don't have to get every gram of it off, but most of it, it's super chewy. Then there's also big globs of intermuscular fat you probably want to shave off, especially on the flip side where the vertebrae used to be. I'm less worried about trimming fat. There you go, nice and clean. When you're working with such an expensive product, you want to try to minimize the amount of wastage because obviously, you know, everything that you throw in the trash or you're not going to use, you're wasting money. And the one thing that you want to try to avoid is while taking off the silver skin, creating these divots in the meat. When taking off the silver skin, you can actually take the silver skin and pull it back. And if it starts to catch, you can use the knife to help cut the skin away. That will help minimize the amount of wastage or the amount of meat that you actually waste with all these divots. 
Now, really only the center portion works for a Wellington. The ends are too thin. They'd be horribly overcooked. Use those for something else. I'm gonna freeze all of my edible trimmings for another day. That center cut roast, fully butchered, would probably cost about as much mm. as the whole tenderloin. It may not cost 150 just for the actual fillet, but it's still gonna be expensive. The one thing though is when you're making the beef Wellington, you want to try to make it as cylindrical as possible. From one end to the other, it's going to be the same diameter. This this helps with the cooking process. You see here that the center is a little thicker. You should trim away a little bit at the center. Season that two pound roast aggressively with salt and pepper. There's a lot of meat there to flavor. And I'll massage that with a thin film of oil before dropping it into an extremely hot pan. As hot as you can go without burning anything. Mm. The goal is to get some brown flavor on the outside of this while cooking the inside, not at all. So I'm gonna roll this around and then not a minute later, mm. out it comes. Now this is good, but the one thing that you can do with a saute pan like this, because it has a nice shallow, like gradual incline, use the edge of the pan as well to sear the meat as you're cooking it. Because again, we're just searing the meat. We don't want to be cooking it like fully through. And thus, of course, you do want it well done. Then you may want to cook it a little longer here so you're not going to burn the puff pastry. But while this pan is hot, I'm going to drop in all of my inedible trimmings, all of that silver skin and everything. This will give flavor and body mm. to my sauce. While that browns, I'll roughly chop some shallots. Mm. I would use a whole big onion instead if I had one. Super rough. It's all all getting strained out in the end and in with the beef trimmings to brown. Now, if anybody is wondering what is a shallot, shallots are not as potent as onions and they're a little sweeter as well. So they're in between basically garlic and an onion. I'll drop in a tiny spoon of tomato paste. Not worth opening a whole can just for this. Just use it if you've got it handy. Brown that for a second. And before stuff starts burning, I will deglaze with like half a bottle of red wine. You could just use water. If you want to use a little fruit juice, just use a tiny splash. Otherwise, the sauce will be way too sweet. Traditionally, or at least typically, beef wellington is served with demi-glaze. Now, demi-glaze is the half reduction of sauce espanol. Today, we typically make the veal stock first, and then after passing it and doing everything that we do to the stock, it takes like a day, day and a half, two days, then we reduce it until we have a good consistency and well, we finish it with a lot of butter and we have the half glaze demi sauce. And if anybody is wondering, I do have a very good beef stock recipe, which also works for veal. So if you wanna make a veal stock, use the same recipe, just change the bones that you're using. The advantage of cooking with wine is most of the sugar has been fermented away. Even still, I will top this off with at least as much water as wine. I always think sauces made with straight red wine are way too strong. You can use the trimmings, throw some thyme in at the end and make a very nice little quick sauce that goes with your beef wellington. So the traditional filling that goes between the beef and the crust is a mushroom duxelle. My wife Lauren doesn't like mushrooms, so she suggested pureed greens bound with some breadcrumbs. We'll try that. I'll put in half a bag of baby spinach for color and for flavor. I've got a bunch of fresh parsley and a few sage leaves just because I have those. Yes, traditionally you do make a duxelle, which is a mushroom paste. Mushrooms have a very savory umami you know, type flavor that goes very well with the beef wellington. And if you don't want that, that's fine. You can substitute with other things. Actually using spinach is a good idea. You can use courgettes, you can use aubergine, zucchini and eggplant to substitute if you don't want to make the normal duxelle. You know, when making it at home, it is a good idea to experiment. Some pepper, a pinch of salt, maybe some ground ginger to make it Christmassy, and then to get a moldable texture, it's about one part mm -hmm. breadcrumbs to two parts greens. I'm using panko because it's more absorbent, and one function of this layer in any Wellington is to soak up juices from the roast so that the pastry doesn't get wet. You could do this with the panko breadcrumbs, but if you're gonna be using a lot of spinach and you wanna keep the color, you could also blanch the spinach and then wring out the spinach to try to get rid of all the moisture. Or you could even throw it in a saute pan. Water is the enemy of making this because if you have too much water, you're gonna end up with a soggy Wellington. I'll give it a squeeze of lime juice. Might help prevent some enzymatic browning, but I don't wanna use too much or it'll taste weird. There we go. You need a texture kind of like modeling clay. Yeah, adding a little bit of lime to this can make it taste, well, weird, no, but like 
different. A lime in a beef wellington is something that I haven't experimented with. What's very traditional is to coat the seared roast in mustard, a nice mm. thick layer. I think he's using Kraft Dijon mustard, and if you can get real Dijon, or if you can even maybe use English mustard, uh, warning, yeah, English mustard, the powder, it's spicy, like very spicy. Now I'm gonna grab a sheet of plastic wrap and lay down enough of my green stuff to coat the bottom of the roast. Roast on top, mold the rest all the way around. Don't worry about the ends, you're just gonna trim those off. It'd also be traditional to make some crepes to wrap around this, again, to absorb juices. I'm a bet on the absorbing power of panko to do that job. Mm. It'd also be traditional to wrap this in thin sliced parma ham. I think that's just excessive. There are a few little tips to make this easier. So if you have a big roll of film and you set your cutting board down and you put the film in front of you and then you put it over the cutting board, this will help give you more force when rolling to help make everything more even. Plenty of flour and now we roll into a shape that will envelop our roast and thickness about a half a centimeter maybe. Oh, last thing, I need to beat an egg with a little water to make an egg wash for glue. Roast goes on. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have some excess pastry, but that's better than not having enough. Now, if you do end up with a beef wellington at the end that looks like this, it's fine because you can actually fix this. You can rewrap it, wrap it tighter this time until you have more of a uniform little cylindrical wellington. It will make a very big difference because it will not cook evenly. You can use the excess for something else, or you can cut out little strips for a lattice decoration on top paint some mm. egg wash on that seam so that it seals, hide the seam on the bottom, crimp the ends, wrap in plastic, and this much you could do the day before, throw it in the fridge. If your beef wellington is already like this, it's gonna look like this when you cut it. If you're gonna actually spend the time and the money to make this and serve it to somebody that you may want to impress, you might as well do it properly. Sauce is ready to strain. I'm gonna do it in my gravy separator so that I can get out some of the fat. I've got some cheesecloth in there to get out finer particles because we're being fancy today. There's no way I'm not gonna spill this, and yes, I'm spilling. Mm. You could just throw this in the fridge the day before. The fat would solidify on top and you could lift it off. Now, obviously with the camera, it's a pain to move everything around and sometimes it's hard to show but if you do this in the sink or maybe even having say a tray or something underneath to collect any juice that may run off a little fresh thyme in there to infuse I'm just gonna reduce this a little bit if you want a thick sauce you could reduce it to a glaze I want a thinner more voluminous sauce that I can really flood the plate with so that's enough time out now I will lower the heat so there's no bubbling and I will gradually emulsify in a ton of cold butter monte a burr as long as you go slow and you don't get the butter too hot, the sauce will accept a nearly endless amount of butter. Right, monte au beurre. I've mentioned this technique before. This is a technique that we do at the end when a sauce is almost finished, like when we're making, say, demi-glaze. We add butter to it, and this adds a nice richness, a creaminess. If you have a very little amount of sauce, like here, and you add, like, half a pound of butter into it, it's going to be more butter than it is that sauce. If you want to thicken a sauce like this in a little saute pan, if you have only a little bit of sauce, you can do what's called beu manier. Beu manier is kneaded butter. So you take a little stick of butter, you put it in a little bit of flour, you knead it, you work it in your hands until it's mixed well, and what you have is a quick cheat. It's like having a little roux that you then add to the saucepan and it will thicken the sauce. You don't need to add a lot. That was salted butter, so I won't need to season this. I'll pour it into a sauce boat and I can reheat that in the microwave right before dinner on low power. If it boils, the emulsion breaks and it won't be thick anymore, so be careful. If you look at the sauce right now, for me, it's too thin. If it's this thin and it's like water, it's not finished. And if you add enough butter, there will be a point where you can break your sauce. And having a split sauce is not the end of the world. I mean, it's bad. It's not the end of the world, though. You can fix it. A little flour on my sheet pan to keep the Wellington from sticking, and on it goes. To try to cook Oof. this without a probe thermometer would be an act of pure self-hatred. It's the only way to know what's happening. Paint this with the rest of our egg wash. That'll make it brown and shiny. Mm -hmm. And a very easy way to decorate is to score the top with a knife Ooh. after you've painted with the egg. That'll get you a better color contrast. When using a knife to decorate it, which is 
is a great way on adding a little decoration to your puff pastry. You want to use the back end of the knife, not the sharp end, not the blade, because what can happen is you cut through the puff pastry and you just want to make an indentation. You don't want to like slice through it. Just make your cuts very shallow. I went too deep on a lot of these and you'll see them spread too much in the oven. The lines get too thick. You want shallow cuts for fine lines. Use the back end of the knife. That way you won't have to worry about cutting too deep. In my oven, 425 Fahrenheit convection works, 220C, but you can adjust as it bakes. If it looks like the outside isn't going to be brown enough by the time the mm. beef is done, you can jack up the heat as you go. The key is to take it out way before the beef is done as you want it. I'm pulling it at 110 Fahrenheit 43C. Mm. Look, we went from 110 to 135 Fahrenheit outside the oven. That's almost medium. I would like it rarer. 135 Fahrenheit is about medium rare, but if you want it medium, you need to cook the center or the thickest part, as in case in point here, the thickest part. You need to cook it to 145 minimally. At the last minute, I'll steam some broccolini until fork tender. Those always look nice. Mm. You really need a serrated knife to cut this or the pastry will just shatter. And it'll shatter if you try to do a thin slice. It's got to be thick and chunky. We've got six portions, tops from this roast. If there's one thing that you can do to make your beef wellington look a little nicer and you don't want to go through a lot of effort, but just one little thing is to use the proper knife. There's a difference between using a serrated knife, which is what I have here with large teeth, or a serrated knife with teeth like this. It looks more like a saw. And when cutting the beef wellington, it's important to use a knife where you make long strokes so you don't have this zigzag cut, which you can clearly see how many strokes he used to cut this beef. Flood the plate with sauce, lay on the wellington, vegetables, and there you go. Is it worth it? Absolutely not, in my opinion. I think for Christmas dinner this year, I'm just gonna do a normal tenderloin roast with that sauce, but you know, you do you. First off, I wanna say that if anybody starts accusing me that I'm attacking Adam, this is not personal, yeah? I like Adam. The beef wellington, on the other hand, could be a little better. I mean, honestly, and it takes practice. This is one of those things that does take practice, but a few little things here, a few little things there, you can make a nicer looking beef wellington. If you wanna see a beautiful beef wellington made, check out Ramsey's video that we reviewed. And if you want to make the puff paste for yourself, then check out Chef Bruno as well and say hi from me as well. In any case, guys, take care. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe as well as it helps me out greatly. Check out my new website as well. <laughs> Lots of things. And I will see you guys again very soon. Until then, take care.